So on uh, Wednesday night this week, um, we had our members meeting, and uh, one, one of the things that happened during our members meeting is that Terry came up with uh, a song that meant something during a prayer time. And today we're going to be talking about the sovereignty of God, about God being the king, God being all-powerful, and being the one in charge. And to be a subject of a sovereign means that you have to submit to the Heavenly Father, right? I mean, that's what it means to be a subject from a king. And Terry brought up this song, which was so important to me in my faith journey that I wanted to share with you uh, that moment for me. It was a moment of me rededicating my life to Christ, uh, it was a moment where uh, it was almost like an alpha course. <clears throat> it wasn't an alpha course, but it was similar to an alpha course where uh, we, we went as men one weekend and the ladies went another weekend and we was just really immersed in who is God and who is he to me and what does he mean to me. And eventually it got to the point where I had to uh, come to terms with the lordship of Jesus Christ, the fact that he is my leader and that I am called to follow. And for me, that was a really powerful moment. And this hymn from uh, the Psalter hymnal, uh, number 544, as a matter of fact, I, I don't even have to look through my hymnal. It just opens to that song uh, in, in the one that I have. And it goes like this, lead me, guide me along the way, for if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with you and lead me my whole life through. And I remember sitting in a room... And of course, they set this up ahead of time, right, so that um, everybody would be committing themselves or dealing with something in their life or uh, asking God for forgiveness over something. And for me, it was the submitting to the Heavenly Father who is my Lord and my King. And I remember writing this down on a little piece of paper and handing it over to someone who then burned it in a little candle that was in a bucket of sand and so on and so forth. Symbolically, just kind of saying, God, I give this over to you. I give over the control of my life to you. And that was really, really powerful moment for me. And when I talk about the sovereignty of God in this series, I want to uh, again remind you that Jesus is our King, that he is the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one. But this idea of sovereignty has so many blessings attached to it. We're not just being treated as a slave that we think about from our understanding of what slaves are. It's not just that we give over and give over to the king and we get nothing in return. There's so much that we receive from being a subject of the king of kings and the lord of lords. And I want to just talk about this idea of sovereignty today. <clears throat> it goes beyond intellectual and human kind of understandings of things. And it has blessings. It inspires us. It moves us. It comforts us in the midst of trials and temptations and sorrows. And it's an encouragement for us. And I hope that you get to hear that. This series about the crown is about how God revealed himself to us. We talked about the scriptures and about how God's word can be learned and how he uh, tells about himself there, that it can be trusted. And this idea of sovereignty is so much bigger than just that he is king of kings, but it has an impact upon me today. A little bit earlier this week, I was reading the news, uh, CTV News, and I came across a news article from the Montreal uh, um, CTV article from a guy named the, part, the New Parti Québécois. Québec, thank you. That's my terrible French. The leader, uh, Paul St. Pierre, he said on Tuesday that he didn't want to swear an oath to King Charles. This is him. He said uh, he's going to refuse to swear an oath to the king. Basically, he and uh, the party that he is the leader of are a separatist party. They're basically saying that if they get into power in Quebec, they will lead a movement to separate from Canada. Uh, whether that's to join France or be separate on their own, I'm not sure. But uh, he basically said he has a conflict of interest. He said, the first act that I do as a member of parliament cannot be to swear allegiance to the, uh, the party and to Quebec and then swear allegiance to the king. He says, I can't do that. Uh, the king of a foreign country, he says. He's obviously not feeling that he is his own king. And then he said this, which I thought was quite interesting. He says, it's obviously a conflict of interest. You can't serve two masters at the same time. 
He's quoting from Matthew chapter 6, which says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I thought it was kind of ironic that a man who claims no religious background is quoting a religious text to, uh, to point out, to make his point. But in essence, what he was saying is that he's not going to be governed by this king. And a lot of people today have real trouble with the idea of God being sovereign, that he's the one in control. He's the one who uh, has all authority and power. And we have questions about that. We have, uh, we have some skepticism about that. A lot of us just want to rebel against that idea that somebody else is in charge. And there are qualities of God that we just don't understand, right? There are some qualities that we do not share with God. One of them is uh, his self-existence, which is basically a, you know, a, a description of the fact that God didn't have a beginning. He was always there. So we talk about in philosophy or in, in uh, biology or in science that there is a cause, a first cause from something. And we go back to that, well, if there is a first cause, who caused the first cause, right? Uh, even scientists today will say that the world was formed out of a big bang, but where did the big bang come from? What's the first cause? And if we point to God and say that God is the first cause, somebody might say, well, who caused God? Where is the first cause for God? But there's a theological principle that says God is self-existent. He was always there. So when God says, I love you, no matter what you do, I loved you yesterday, and I love you today, and I love you tomorrow, that's because he's self-existing. He was always there. He has never been started at some point before, and he always will be there, and he always was there. He is self-existent. We do not share that characteristic with God. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't need us to praise him in order to get stronger. You know, we, He doesn't need us to do things for him because if it doesn't get done, he'll make the rocks cry out if he needs worship, God says to us. He's completely self-sufficient, and yet he still loves us. He's eternal, which is something that we have a beginning but not an end. He's eternal in the sense that he always was and always will be. And he's triune. He is the, in nature three in one. These are characteristics that are unique to God and his sovereignty alone. But we also share some characteristics with God because we have some things that we try to copy or emulate or to project in on ourselves for the good of others, right? We simply confess that we have these other qualities, that we are his creatures, yes, but we share some qualities of God, like his wisdom and truthfulness and mercy and grace and justice, wrath, goodness, faithfulness, and other things. So what is the sovereignty of God? It is his absolute rule and authority over all his creation. He is all-powerful and absolutely free. He has no restrictions whatsoever. And yet, he's greater than anything that we can yet imagine. From 1 Chronicles chapter 29, uh, you know, David tried to put into words when the temple was created and was built and it was dedicated. He tried to put it into words. He said, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord. And this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hands, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. God has no use for money and for power. He gives it and he takes it away. That's his prerogative as God. It's like, you know, printing your own money and handing it out and somebody says, ooh, this is valuable. I'll take this and use it to buy things. To me, it, it's nothing. I made it. It's, it's, it's counterfeit. It has no value. God says, that's the way God looks at money. Money has no value. Power has no value. He gives it and he takes it away. He is the one who does it. 
God's shown his sovereignty over the material world, right? He, he puts everything in order. We know the order of creation. We know that the laws of nature are put into place because God did it. And yet, God can put his hand in the mix and mix things up a bit, right? The parting the Red Sea, uh, the, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, a manna from heaven. These are all stopping the sun in the sky. These are all, you know, completely breaking the rules of the laws of nature. But he also has the ability to transform people's hearts, to change them from one thing to another. God has the ability to harden someone's heart. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he has the power to transform someone's heart. All of these things are the, in the realm of the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> and so that people's, and, and God transforms hearts so that people's, will recognize the love of God. Now, people might say, well, love is more important than all of these other attributes, isn't it? Isn't it just more important than all the others? Well, we've got to be careful with that. Because if we push love being more important than God's justice, then people are left with unjust things because we push the value of love. And if we push the value of justice it leads to wrath without love, that's an imbalance as well. So we can't say that one is more important than the other. God is perfect in all of those things, so he balances those the way they're called to be balanced. And if we deny those, apt, uh, uh, those attributes, and we say, well, God isn't loving, or if God is not just, then he becomes limited. We put limits on him. So I... I uh, reading this book, uh, it's, it's called, um, it's called uh, Overlooked, The Forgotten Origin Stories of Canadian Christianity. And I was thinking about one of the things that was in the book that I found so fascinating. Uh, when Canada was formed, there was a lot of movement north, and Canada is formed with a bunch of losers. I just have to tell you that. Um, the Upper Canada Society is made up of uh, British citizens from the United States who moved into Canada. They lost the war and they moved north. In Quebec, you have the French that lost on the Plains of Abraham. They stayed in Quebec. Out east in Acadia, we have the same thing. We have British people who lost the independence that they were trying to find, or sorry, the Canadians who lost their independence to the British. And they're, interestingly enough, uh, you know, the the Americans have thrown off this idea of monarchy. They say, we will not be governed by a king. In Canada, we kind of moved everybody up north who said, yeah, we don't agree with that, but we're not going to make much trouble about it. This is kind of how Canada gets its politeness. This is, honestly, this is where it comes from. We're a country that recognized that we lost at several different things. And when they came to Canada, the Order of Canada published a medal, literally a, a, a medallion, that was given to people for their loyalty. And on the medallion, on one side of the medallion, is an eagle, spread wings, talons ready to bear. And then there's a river down the middle of this medallion. And on the other side is this little tiny beaver chewing on a piece of wood and a big lion over top of him. And this is Canada. You know, the big eagle down south and the little beaver too busy eating his wood, knowing that the monarch, the lion of Britain, was over top of us, watching over us. And it's a very similar picture for the people of God when it comes to sovereignty. We expected that the British would protect us. We expected that they would also provide for us as a nation. And it's the same thing with our relationship with God. But when we put limits on the monarchy uh, of God, the sovereignty of God, his, his power is weakened. His ability is weakened. And these things uh, produce a, a caricature of what God is like. We say, well, uh, you know, uh, God uh, created, well, we don't know for sure. It could have been a million years ago. It could have been 7 million years ago. It could have been 100 million years ago. It could have been 6,000 years ago. Well, if he didn't create, then can he really create anything good within us? Oh, no, now we've got limits. There are blessings that come with the sovereignty of God. People want to 
push it down and they want to stop it. They want to uh, keep God from uh, being who he is supposed to be. I was watching uh, the movie Thor. How many of you are Marvel fans? Yeah? I was watching the movie Thor. Uh, it's called um, Love and Thunder. All right, it's the newest one to put out this past year. And in one scene, Thor takes Valkyrie, Jane, and Korg to the Golden Temple, uh, which resides in Omnipotent City, which is the place where all of the gods of the universe live. About 3,000 or so, or, pardon me? Spoiler alert. alert. Yes, if you haven't watched it yet, I'm going (laughs) to, I'm going to give you a little bit, but a little bit of the story here. So, in walks Thor, and he's so excited to be there, and he starts introducing them to all these gods, and he introduces them to um, uh, Bao, the god of dumplings, and, uh, you know, <laughs> Nini of Nani, and uh, Dionysus, Minerva, Artemis, Isis, Sekhmet, and a whole bunch of others. And he walks in, and he sees all of these gods in this arena, and of course, Zeus is up in the top in this floating you know, throne with all these beautiful women hanging around him. And he presents to Zeus the problem that he came for, which is that there is a God killer out there who's going to kill them all if they don't deal with it. But Zeus is more interested in throwing his thunderbolt around and getting the crowds up on their feet. And he's talking about orgies and he's talking about human sacrifices. And then when when Thor finally confronts him and says, aren't you going to do anything? Zeus says... I'm afraid. If God is not omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, if God is not self-evident that he has always been there, was here, is here, and always will be, if none of those things are true, then the gods that we worship become like this caricature in the movie of of Thor. Zeus has a problem He has all these quirks and faults. Thor, he's so full of himself that he can't see things right in front of him. And all of these gods have their flaws and failures. And they refuse to step up and help humanity. That's not the God that we serve. That is such a bad example of what God could be. He has all absolute power, control, and authority, and wisdom. This is one of the blessings of being a follower of God, being a subject of the sovereign, our Lord. It deepens our worship and our living and true to our living and true God. It helps us to recognize that God, you can do all things in all situations. But I might not know the plan. I might know all, not know all the details. But at least I have this uh, belief in my mind that it's possible that you have a plan that I cannot see. Just think about when you're in the middle of temptations or sorrows or some of the biggest trials that you're going through in your life. What would it be like if God wasn't sovereign? If he didn't know everything? If God was not out there caring absolutely for every single one of you, no matter what you did, no matter when you did it, wouldn't it just be like, give up and die? Because if God is the way he says he is, the way he claims he is, then there's got to be a plan and a purpose. And I don't know what it is, and I'm going to go through it knowing and trusting that God is perfect, and He is all-knowing, and He has a plan. And I maybe now won't even see it until I get to heaven. That's how beautiful it is to know that God is sovereign in my life. God's sovereignty provides encouragement and joy when it comes to evangelism. I mean, think about the faith that we want to share with people, Right? Uh, We want you to give up your life and give it over to Jesus. We want you to take up your cross and follow him. Uh, We want you to know that in this life you will have trouble. Right? This is what we're selling, folks. And sin, right? We've got to recognize that you're sinful, but you need a savior. And in order for you to receive salvation, you have to give your life over to the King of kings and Lord of lords. But if it's on me to do that, I, I'm lost. I mean, who would want to, want to buy that from someone like me? I'm a sinful person. 
They'll look at me and they look at my life and go, you haven't got it together. Why would I buy what you got? But because God is sovereign, I have this encouragement that I can go to people and say, look, all I'm going to do is tell you what Jesus told me. And I'm going to tell you what it's done for me in my life. And I'm just going to share the good news with you. And because God is sovereign, he knows whom he's going to call. He's the one who draws them. He's the one who does the work in the Holy Spirit in their life. And my responsibility is just to tell the story because God said, you must participate with me in sharing the good news. Without someone sharing the words, they will not know that salvation is real. That's the beauty of God's sovereignty and evangelism. And God's sovereignty gives us a very deep sense of security in our life. That someone knows what's going on. When I, when I think to myself, I haven't got a clue what to do next. You know, I was at that meeting on Wednesday night, and I got stuck. I, I thought I had it all planned out about how to lead that prayer time and about how to move things through one stage to another. And I got to that second prayer time, and uh, some people started asking me questions. George was one. Rose was the other one. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I thought I knew what I was supposed to do. I thought I knew how I was supposed to lead this group in this next stage, in this next piece. But in the end, I can remember standing there thinking to myself, I just don't know. And then the Spirit spoke. And then we began to feel what we needed to do next. I'm so grateful that God is the sovereign and he's in control of that. Because if you'd followed my dumb advice, we'd probably go off in that direction, which was wrong. Just listen to what the Bible says about how we can be confident about the authority of God from the book of Romans. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all these things. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's how great God is. That's how powerful he is. That's how much knowing he has about all things that me and my small, puny little mind, my goldfish brain, is so small in comparison to God. I've been reading from a book by James Boyce, and he he put these seven verses together. He said, these seven verses uh, lay out the whole counsel of God, almost all of the theological things that we hold dear. These seven verses bring us to a recognition that if it wasn't for this from God, our sovereign Lord, we would be lost. Hebrews 7 verse 25 Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. That's Jesus. He came to save everyone who came to him. And he intercedes for us. Mel Trotter is uh, an evangelist. We lived in Grand Rapids for a few years, and he started the uh, Grand Rapids City Rescue Mission. And he was an alcoholic who was saved from his alcoholism. He said this was his favorite verse. He started this ministry to street people in uh, in Grand Rapids. And he said uh, that it's God's ability to save a person from the guttermost to the uttermost. That's our story. It covers the past, the present, and the future. For 2 Timothy 1 verse 2, this is Paul speaking here. He's saying, that's why I'm suffering here in prison. I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one whom I trust, and I'm sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of Christ's return. Everything that Paul had done, he's saying, look, even if I'm in jail, even if things are terrible for me right now, 
Everything that I have done for God, all the preaching that I've done, all the teaching that I've done is like it's being put in a trust account in heaven. And one day God is going to reward me for being who he called me to be and sharing the gospel. My spiritual deposits are with God. He'll recognize us for what we've done. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You know, some people think that our faith is this pie in the sky promise about some future reality when we die and go to heaven. That's not what this verse teaches us. It says it's available now. Salvation is here. It's God's grace is available to us every single day. God is so good that he says, I can see each and every one of you in the individual thoughts and thinking of your every specific moment. And I know enough about you to know that you will do some stupid things in your life, and I love you anyway. And I also know that you will try to serve me. And I will love you for doing that. But neither the dumb things nor the good things is going to change how much I love you in this moment. And God's power is with us. He will provide all we need and have plenty left over to share with others. Hebrews 2 verse 18, we're told that God is able to help us in times of temptation. Since he himself has gone through suffering, that's Jesus, and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes on to say, God will not tempt you beyond what you're capable of handling. And he's going to provide a way for you to escape when it comes along. Jesus knows our weakness. He knows our temptations. And yet he provided a way for us to get through it. Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite verses. I wish Rose was here because she could say it with me by memory. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus speaks to us, teaches us, helps us to grow, and do so much more than we could ever imagine. I mean, think about what God has done in your life. Could you imagine anyone else but God doing what he's done in your life? God's ability to save us also extends to our physical bodies. That's just so awesome. Uh, Philippians 3.21, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. God can do that. How many of you are looking forward to that day? Amen. Right? No more having to worry about standing on the scale. No more having to worry about uh, back problems. No more having to worry about, you know, uh, whatever ailments you're going through. And then from Jude 24, 25, this is just like incredible. Just like now, all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who, is, who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. All these verses taken together are the counsel of God around his sovereignty. Are these things true? Yes, they are. But only if God is sovereign. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much that you are without blemish that you are without sin, that you always were, that you are, and that you always will be, provides us with so many blessings, God. Lord, help us as we try to live out uh, what it means to be servants of yours, subjects of yours. Lord, there is something that we are called to do in this life. We're called to share our faith with others, absolutely, but you've got a unique calling and purpose upon us. Father, I help, I pray that you would help us figure out what those things are. And today, as we sing this song about how great you are, about how awesome you are, about how much you love us, even in that greatness, Lord, we praise you. We give you thanks for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.